Hey everybody, welcome to the Garden Path Podcast. Uh, this is going to be episode three, and today I'm going to talk uh, with my husband, Chris. Um, Hello. And we're going to kind of talk about uh, garden plans for 2016. Um, so in 2015, we kind of slacked a lot. We had a, a new son at the latter part of 2014, and so we kind of had our hands full in 2015. Um, so I think we want to kind of get back on track in 2016. So um going to be kind of open-ended, but uh, a few things I do want to talk about. Um, like Kind of one thing that's kind of I see daily as, well, maybe not daily, but often is our compost pile, which we built in, I don't know, three years ago now, almost? Yeah, it was pretty much right after we built the house because we used the trees that we cut down. We didn't build the house, but when we moved or, in, yes, yeah. When we, when we, sorry, when we moved in and cut the trees down, we had dead trees in the yard, and I built the compost pile out of the dead trees. Yeah, so the 2011 drought killed a lot of trees uh, in Texas, and we had a bunch of dead pine trees, some sweet gum, and magnolia, and things like that, um, so we had to come in and clean all that up. And so anyway, the compost pile was built out of those trees, and they were starting to rot, and... Yeah, I'll probably have to rebuild it here in a, maybe in a year or two. Yeah, I was thinking maybe we'd get another year out of it, but we're going to have to fix the... I might just rebuild that center section. Yeah. What are the, the front boards made out of? The... Those are just cedar fence boards. Yeah, so we get a, they've come un, unnailed to the wood um, outline of the compost pile. So we've got to figure that out. And uh, I think the right side of the compost is actually looking pretty good. I think I need to just decompose another month or two and I'm going to use it for the spring. For, our, I don't know, the vegetable garden at least. I don't yeah. Know what else. One thing, I don't know, I guess I realized last year is that uh, the dried leaves make really good compost. I mean, as just as a base, then throw in other stuff in with them. But, um, but you want to try to shred them. Because when you lay a whole bunch of leaves down in a compost pile, it'll it'll form almost like a almost like a tarp or something. It'll act like a tarp in the compost pile. Those flat leaves will like form a barrier, and and the water won't be able to get down to the bottom. Yeah. So well, the, then it makes it hard to turn too. So. Yeah. So the bottom will be like dry and totally just like regular leaves, like they were in the yard like a year later, <laughs> because the water never got to them. Yeah. So you got a, a so lot how, of how some, do you shred it so they can yeah some I bought like uh, there's a I think it's a Toro but it's it's a red and black electric leaf blower if you look on like Amazon or something you'll see it it has a white bag with it and the leaf blower is like reversible so you can suck leaves up it'll shred them and blow them into that bag and then it can just dump them in the in the okay. compost bin then yeah you actually have like piles of leaves from last year that we collected to yeah. still use. <laughs> We got bags and bags of leaves, like, from his mom and my mom. We would drive around neighborhoods, and I think we even bagged some of our own leaves last year. Um, usually, we just kind of mow them and let them decompose in the yard. But So we have a lot of leaves left over. I guess the big problem is coming up with, like, green greens a lot of times. I mean, we use weeds and stuff, but... Yeah, weeds is very debatable in the compost world. Like, some people think you're going to get the the seeds from the weeds are spreading, going to spread everywhere. And that's kind of true. I mean, you'll, you will spread some seeds for sure, but I don't know. We've to we've, we've chosen. It doesn't really, it doesn't bother us matters that much. And we just throw all the weeds in there and then just pick the weeds when they sprout. Yeah. So I don't know. We have, I've also gone through neighborhoods for people who bag their, their uh, grass clippings and I'll pick those up, but occasionally you'll get trash and, the wrong, you know, the wrong stuff. <laughs> so yeah, just make sure if when you compost, though, you can actually do all leaves, but don't do like all grass. It'll just get you won't get good compost. It'll turn really nasty and mushy, and yeah, it won't be good if you don't have browns in it. Yeah, dry, you know, leaves or and something else I also do is I get the uh, the coffee grounds from Starbucks. They used uh, grounds from your garden. And so there's a Starbucks in our grocery store, and I'll go through every, I don't know, a couple months and ask if they have any. And 
get a couple bags and they usually give me, gosh, tons of them as much as I want. And I, we put them in there and mix the coffee grounds in because I drink coffee at home, but it's usually not enough, you know, to make a big difference. So, um, and then our kitchen scraps, of course, but I, you know, not always like thinking to throw things out there. So, so I guess a compost pile is a, something to attack and then obviously catching up on, I don't know, the neglected garden, <laughs> uh, behind the bees for sure. That was that kind of got crazy, crazy. Yeah, needed. I'm planning the, so. we, the beehive like has this little, little strip of garden behind it or, you know, flower garden behind it. But I'm always, a, like, when the bees are active, I never really want to go back there and <laughs> pull weeds. So my plan is now to, like, on a, you know, a cold day that they're not going to come out, go back there and pull all the weeds. And then also the neighbors have some cherry laurel trees that they're right on the other side of the fence, but they've turned into these huge bushes that are hanging over our flower garden now. So I need to... Trim that back. I need to go over there, too, you know, on a cold day and basically cut those down they're like saplings they're like you know maybe one or two inch diameter trunks that just need to be cut down yeah i don't know i mean do you think the what, what we had back there with the herbertia or mm-hmm. in the yeah. herbertia and then we had some uh the propeller flower too propeller Probably. iris i don't know i don't know if they're even going to come back if they've been think they will. sucked out by all the weeds but um yeah definitely the the flower garden over by the bees need some help this year some more attention i was i was kind of afraid to work over there too well when i was pregnant and then even you know afterwards getting stung and things like that so come up with some good plants that maybe don't need as much attention yeah i think we just need to make a plan for like that area to kind of get neglected and only get cared once or twice a year (laughs) yeah so I, i don't know there's definitely some plants to move around that i feel like are getting too much shade like that variegated canna and kind of getting leggy over there i don't know i don't know things to look at um at least that's in the flower garden area and then the banana trees got way too thick this year yeah i think i only want like maybe three or four three banana trees to grow next year yeah. this year we have just like a clump of like 10 eight. or something yeah <laughs> and they're crazy. like 20 feet tall or 15 feet tall well i'm Whenever we get the chance, and it's probably not going to happen this year, but maybe next year is getting that deck built and the, maybe a garden around the deck down by the pond to put banana Because we had banana trees down there at one point, and the deer just kept eating them. You don't like that idea? No, I don't really have envision a garden around the deck down there. Well, remember we talked <laughs> about it with the extra, all those extra bricks. It was an idea at once. I know that. Um... So what else have you been kind of doing in the yard? We've both been kind of slacking lately. Um, um, well, I mean, I, got, I don't know. I guess lately, because it's the middle of December now, and I've been, I've been trying to keep up with the trees around the yard um, recently. I've been, well, we, we replanted some, uh, let's see, up front, we planted some, Mexican, two Mexican plums where we had some magnolias magnolias that died. Yeah, they were ornamental ones like the yellow bird magnolia and I think like Jane magnolia yeah, maybe? Yeah, Jane something. Um, just not good. It wasn't a good habitat for them. And the, some of them died because it was kind of the wrong, just the wrong soil, to, you know, kind of water and soil, wrong area. And some of them died because the oh dear. the deer this time of year the bucks in our neighborhood rub the trees with their antlers and um they can kill them because they rub all the bark off and a couple of them died like that so i've i've tried to be more diligent about making like little fence barriers like just around the trunks of the trees and uh so i've been this is the time of year in the late fall and winter that you want to well really winter not more very late fall and winter that you want to plant and trim trees. Um, And so like all the fruit trees, I'm sure if you do a quick search on YouTube, you'll see, but I I use like the, they call it like the open vase method of trimming and pretty much any, 
any branch that's pointing towards the center of the tree you cut out. And so all the branches are end up facing outwards and growing up and out, not anything in. So there's almost like a, you know, the sunlight can, can go into the middle of the tree. Um, and I, you know, I pruned our three peach trees, um, a few days ago and our how, apple tree. Sorry. How is that, that, what was it? A four in one or three in one peach? It's a, the five in one, five in one. peach and nectarine, nectarine, I think. Are the plantains doing better on the... Well, yeah. See, we bought this five in one peach and nectarine and, um, Two of the two of the varieties quickly got much stronger than the other three, and I guess I kind of knew, but it was too hard for me to actually. You're supposed to trim the stronger ones way back, and let the weaker ones catch up, uh, which in you know hindsight I, I would have done, and I just didn't, and so two of the varieties have gotten much much stronger like they're the dominant the branches on those are like maybe inch and a half diameter and the other ones are maybe like half an inch still the other three varieties and so i've still i still trim the tree to allow light as much as i can to the three weak varieties but i think probably over time those three the other three varieties will end up dying and we'll end up with a tree with two varieties but in the meantime, I'm just going to keep those other three alive and maybe get a little bit of fruit off them. Yeah, yeah. But the, that one's a five-in-one, and then we have one that's a um, red barren peach. It's a red flower with a, um, a double bloom. And it's a very showy flower that has um, really good peaches. And then the other peach tree we have is a mid-pride peach. It's not as showy flowers, but um, the, the fruit is one of the best fruit that we can grow here. Yeah, and our problem is because we're in zone 9A, uh, we got to have low chill hours on the peaches. So a lot of varieties, you know, we have to be picky about. And um, Yeah, we have to get trees like, I think if I remember right, it's been a while, but like 200 to maybe 500 is pushing it, but two, between 2 and 500 chill hours. Yeah, so that kind of brings us back to the apple tree you were kind of talking about. We had tried what was the name of it the apple tree oh carnival the carnival apple um which apples are kind of hard to grow in our area as well the carnival was touted to be a low chill for for the south, south texas uh, or in southern climates in the united states and um anyway so we tried planting two of them and actually one of them has done really well. The second one, we actually even tried replacing it, and both trees, both trees in the same spot, just didn't die or just didn't make it, so it died. Which is so we just cut that one out. And so the one in our front yard is doing really well. Um, yeah, except you know, I don't know. I guess it's just because I've I've never I didn't grow up, and many people don't grow apple trees down here. But <clears throat> I think apple trees are known to get fire blight. And I think, I think, we have that. I think that's what ours has a little bit of. I've kind of kept it under control with, I sprayed it with uh, neem oil and insecticidal soap a few times last year. Um, and that seemed to keep whatever it was suppressed, but it's still there. So I guess I need to read about that online for next spring. And, you know, I guess we'll double check and see if that's what it, I'm not even sure it is fire blight. Um, and try to keep that under control more next year so it can get bigger and our our neighbor planted a like a three-in-one apple tree that they oh, got did? from home depot last year oh, I didn't know that. which i don't know if it's going to make it but i know um this the carnival apple doesn't have to have a another apple tree to cross pollinate but it i think it helps it a lot and so if his apple tree lives a few years maybe maybe the bees can you know, help cross pollinate it a little bit right. and get some more fruit. Yeah. So speaking of bees, how are the bees doing? Um, the bees right now are pretty good. Um, I'm not, 
they had cross combed a bunch of their uh, comb. Um, and I kind of, after they did one or two and I kind of just was busy and busy and lazy combination, I didn't get in there and fix it. So, um, after that, I just kind of let them cross combing, knowing that I'd have to get in there and harvest the honey out and cut that comb out later. And so, I don't know, several months ago we got in there and I got, I cut, and I, I don't remember exactly, but like 10 or 12 bars of comb off. And we ended up getting like three gallons of honey. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> and it was probably, a, it was definitely more than I would have taken if the bars weren't cross combed. But I had to cut those cross comb, uh, you know, bars back so they would start making straight comb again. So I'm going to have to watch them this winter and get in there and check them on a warm day. I may have to give them some sugar water um, later in the winter if they run out of honey. Um, I had to do that the first year and it worked fine. Yeah, I'm actually kind of curious, like, I mean, we've had this really, I think most of the countries had a weird warm spell the last month. So, I mean, February is kind of our coldest month, and that'll be kind of the telling of, like, what's really going to happen. But I'm kind of, if I already saw, like, that there's a plant on the other side of our fence by our compost pile that usually blooms, like, late January, February, kind of like an early spring kind of plant. I already saw it starting to bloom with this warm weather, so... You know, if it stays warm, we might get blooms earlier than the normal, and the bees might be okay with getting some nectar. But, you know, I'm kind of curious what's going to happen. You never know. It's kind of weird. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I'm not really worried about them. I can, you know, if they start getting low on honey, I'll just give them sugar water and uh, get them through the winter. Yeah, it'll be fine. And I'll just watch that cross coming next year. How did um, we had, what do we have, mites? No, we had those. We had the first year, we had the hive. I, you know, the hive I was, beetles. Yeah, hive when beetles. I was first learning, we had got the the small hive beetles, and um, and they kind of got out of control because I didn't know what to look for and I didn't know how to treat them, and I ended up taking. They were hiding in the hive in the um, divider, because the beet the the hive beetles are way smaller than the the bees. And so the bees normally can kind of keep them in check. Um, they don't necessarily kill them. They just pester them a lot. And so they won't want to be there. Um, but if the hive beetles have somewhere to hive, hide from the bees, then, you know, they can reproduce and kind of have a safe spot. So I took all their hiding spots away and I treated them with um, boric acid, uh, you know, a special way that the bees couldn't get the boric acid. And, um, pretty much, I mean, I got them greatly under control. I mean, from what I understand now, most hives have, uh, the hive beetles. It's just kind of keeping them under control. And so, you know, when I get in there now, I'll see, you know, a few, you know, one or two. Do or you, like, try to kill them or? Yeah. Yeah. I always smash the ones I see. Yeah. You know, and maybe I'll see maybe 10, but not a lot, like I used to. Like Yeah, there was like crazy. Like when it was when it got bad, I mean, when we had to throw some comb out because of them, you know, I'd open the hive and see, you know, hundreds, 100, 200. Wow, okay. You know, and like when I'd move that divider board, there'd just, you know, there'd be a lot come out. Um, But anyway, so I was finally able to make, I said I've been saving our wax ever since we've had our hive, and finally this year I made like I think it was thirteen candles. Yeah, yeah. And we haven't burned them yet, <laughs> but I bought you know I did research and I bought you know what the wick and a mold. Yeah. That um, I can't remember the oh Man Lake is the place I bought the mold and the wick from. Um, I don't remember what size wick, but it's a twelve inch taper candle. So I had to make one at a time because the it's a silicone mold. So that was kind of, I don't know, tedious, but it, it went actually pretty went, fast. It actually, yeah, it went faster than I thought. I mean, you did like a I couple could do, every evening. Yeah, I, I could think. do like several a day. Yeah. Once and, I got good at it. You, yeah. I sprayed, I got a mold release, a, a spray, and I sprayed it in the, the mold and then put the wick in and, um, and then poured the wax in the mold and let it cool a few hours and... Pulled it out and redid it. Yeah. 
That's pretty cool. I'd like to maybe when we save more wax up, do some more, do something else, like make some soap or something with it. I don't know. Do something cool. Um, but I'm excited that we got to do that. So, um, so let's talk about like, I don't know. Oh, the vegetable garden. What do yeah, you know well, I'm excited about the blackberries this year. Oh, yeah. We When we moved in, we planted blackberries as kind of a divider between the backyard of our neighbor and our our lot. And so we're, I don't know what his lot is, but it's probably about an acre. Yeah, his, no, well, I, his lot's like 0.9, I think. And we're about 1.2 acres. So, I mean, they're, they're big lots and they're kind of wooded and open. But we kind of wanted a little divider um, through there. So Chris rigged up a pretty neat little fence kind of thing. Um, but it turned out that the deer really liked the blackberries. And it was a little too shady. And it just it didn't work very well. So Chris ended up transplanting thing, um, the blackberries over to the vegetable garden where they were mostly protected from the deer. I mean, the deer can kind of reach in through the fence a little bit. But they've gone crazy. Yeah, and they're... they're um... Man, if I remember right, I think they were developed at the University of Arkansas. They're called Kiowa blackberries. And there's this whole series of blackberries that named after... Tribes. Um, yeah, like Native American tribes. Um, but the Kiowa, I think, is still... Well, at least it was when I bought it. It's like It was known to be like the biggest blackberry um, variety. Um, I think... I think they average maybe like an inch and a half long each the fruit so i don't i think they were pretty big and we've there were a couple fruits yeah, we, that we've we got barely but... gotten any i think they may have even been like stunted because just the <laughs> conditions they were in yeah so but now they feel like they feel like a 26 foot um length of fence it's about seven feet tall so um i think next year will be a very good year for yeah blackberries. i mean Hopefully next year we have enough to, you know, make a lot of stuff with. Freeze some and jam and I don't know. I don't know about drying them. I thought that would be good, but probably. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. I'm excited for, I don't know, actually getting some permanent, like, herbs in the perimeter. We have, like, so we have, like, six beds that are... How, how big are they? You're the one that built them all. So. Um, <laughs> the ones in the middle are four feet wide by 16 feet long each. So we have six of those. And then we've kind of put little perimeter beds around the other side. So, so the longest sides of the big vegetable garden are um, kind of narrower. And then the two, the short ends of the, the vegetable area are kind of wider beds. Um and we kind of made them like semi hugel culture, and you know the hugel cultures are typically like built up and stacked. You know everything's like mounded, but um, we didn't really want to do that. So Chris dug down. I was pregnant, so I didn't do a lot of digging. Did a lot of like helping in other ways. Um, so Chris dug down, and then we put all the wood and compost the irrigation and, system. Oh, and the irrigation system and stuff in. Um, out there so i'm really those perimeter beds really kind of languished this last year and we're just now kind of like trying to start filling those in with more permanent like perennial vegetables like artichokes and things like that and all the herbs that um make that kind of the herb bed well and then also like vining plants that need the the perimeter fence to grow on so Maybe, well, like the loofah we grew once and, you know, beans and things. I don't know, you can put sweet peas over there? Or? Yeah, I grow, yeah, I like to grow, well, not necessarily sweet peas. I grow the sugar, I like uh, to grow yeah, the, that's what I mean. Like I like to grow peas. the sugar snap peas and snow peas. I plant them usually right around Christmas Day here. And, um, I don't know, they do, they seem they've done really well. I mean, I mean, we usually can produce way more than we can eat for about a month or two. Yeah. We can go out there, I mean, at any time and, like, pick all we want. Yeah. So. Well, speaking of, like, planting on certain times, I think we're behind on onions. <laughs> we usually well, do that in November, but I know there's, like, a window. Yeah, but... any time between kind of November and January is fine. We yeah. should. We usually plant them. And so. We're usually on the earlier side, yeah. but we can, yeah, we could, I don't know, maybe we can get them 
soon and put them in the ground. Yeah. Maybe we can do it Christmas week or something. So, and then hopefully, maybe, we've never had good luck with garlic. We seem to, like, fail every year. So, maybe this year we're going to have a good garlic year. And then, still want to try potatoes again. We keep failing on potatoes. Yeah, I don't, well, yeah, I got a different variety of garlic this year. I think it's... Do you remember what variety? I think I got Creole Red, but I'll have to look. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what the deal is with garlic. Um, Curd always gets good. Garlic. I think our garlic may just because our. I, I think it may actually stay too wet because our irrigation system. Um, well, I'm just not sure. I don't know. Well, we'll we'll see this year. I know we just part of our problem was not pulling it in time, and part of it was it rotted. And just, yeah, I mean, it grew great last year, but then we we were so busy that we never pulled it. So by the time we pulled it, we just had like little kind of leftover rotting bulbs and yeah. like pieces of bulbs and stuff. And then carrots. How are the carrots doing? We usually do really well um, with carrots. Yeah, or- I'm not really too concerned with the carrots because like last year I planted a bed and a half of carrots and that was too many. <laughs> it was like way, way, way overkill. Oh, like still frozen carrots. Oh so. man, I mean I don't even think I cleaned half of our carrots last year. We ended up giving like half of them away. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And I could barely handle half of them. So. Well, yeah, I was taking care of the babies, so Chris did all the blanching. I had and... this like 128 quart igloo cooler, and the the carrots like filled the entire cooler. Yeah. Just the carrots without the green tops. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean. Psst. We can grow carrots, but we can't grow garlic or potatoes, or apparently now sweet potatoes. We did really good with sweet potatoes one year, and then yeah, crap. sweet potatoes usually. I mean, from what I've read, I don't. They like but that was in the community garden. The sweet they potatoes. almost like um, sandy soil, like almost low nutrient sandy soil. From what I've read, just throw them in the yard. <laughs> and so I think, I think our soil might kind of be too good for them. <laughs> like, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, and tomatoes. I'm looking forward to getting into tomatoes again, but I don't think I'm going to start seeds again this year because I don't think I have the time. Well, unless you want to start seeds, just a time to baby them through winter. So yeah, well, no, we'll probably just buy seedlings. Do what again. we did last year and probably just buy some seedlings as soon as we can. Yeah. Usually, our local like good nursery they get a really good variety of uh, heirloom. Heirloom tomatoes that we'll, we'll probably grow and uh, go with the old standbys that we know work. And we do. I'd like to can more again this year. Get more. We saw. I have some jars that I canned the summer of 2014 that we need to use. But definitely want to can some more and actually make some good pasta sauce again like we did. Yeah. So cause that's always good to use. And um, yeah, another thing like, I don't know, one of my main goals the next year or two is, um, it's not fruit related, but we have a lot of young trees around the yard everywhere, like ornamental trees and some are fruit, some are fruit trees and some are, yeah, native like oak trees and, oh man, we have, uh, cypress trees and, uh, tupelos. Yeah. We have water tupelo, which I would think for like landscaping is very, uncommon, very rare because <laughs> they're, they're a native tree that grows in the swamp, but. Um, the first year we were in the house, I think it was the first year, maybe. The, yeah, like the first month. We were at the nursery, um, the calendar garden, which is like one of our favorite local nurseries. And they had them on clearance for $5. And I remember we bought two of them and they had, they had at least one or two more. And I kind of wish I would have got them all because they've done really well. We They're, they're planted on our pond, right on the edge of the water in our pond. And, um. I don't know. They've just done really well with no maintenance. You know, they're not going to take any trimming at all ever. Um, so we just keep the beavers. There's beavers on our pond, so <laughs> I have yeah, to keep the I beavers gotta, off of them. Right. It's kind of like yeah, the other parts of the yard. I have to fence the trees for the deer, and down by the pond, I have to fence the Stuff the tupelo and the um, cypress. Right, cypress. I have to put like smaller i mean it can just be two feet tall little fencers around them so the beavers don't chew them down yeah i mean we've seen otter out there and the beaver and 
There's rumors of an alligator, which I still don't believe. Yeah. Um, we get eagles. And bald, bald eagles. eagles. All sorts of um, just wading birds and roseate spoonbills. Um, the wood ducks. Oh, we have wood duck boxes. Chris built those like the first year or two. Yeah. So to... we get wood duck uh, babies on the pond, which is really fun. And Yeah, I was thinking I have to get in all the... Boxes I have to get in all the boxes out. in the winter and clean them out, except for the owl box. Owls nest during the winter. Oh, so well, I'll we haven't clean... seen any owls yet. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we have any owls, but I'll clean those out. I'll check and see if there's anything in them in the summertime. Um, and if there's not, I'll clean them out then. So we've got the screech owl box and the barred owl, owl box. box. Yeah. And uh, we never, we've not seen them. seen them be used by owls yet, so... We hear owls. Well, at least we hear the barred owls, so we know they're around. We yeah, I've never heard a screech owl seen, here. Seen them, so It'd be really cool. And we have bat boxes. We have two bat boxes, um, right? Three. Three. We have three. We have three. Yeah, and I have another one I haven't put up. A little one, and then I have plans. Eventually, in the next few years, that I want to make a big bat box that'll hold. <laughs> um, I don't know. In my head, it's like maybe in the. You know, big, maybe like in the five to 10,000 range of bats. So we can get like a big bat colony going. No yeah. mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, you know, we get um, Mexican free tail and, and uh, big brown bats are two most common bats here. And they'll both use um, bat houses pretty regularly. So, yeah, we, uh, was it, I think it was a, first year the first summer the, well maybe the second summer we were here is when we noticed the bats were using our attic and chris got up there and made sure yeah i had got to... them sealed that off after we knew they were out um one evening like he, we watched them fly out and so he sealed that up and then i don't know i seem like shortly after that they started using the boxes yeah and then they haven't i haven't really been watching close but they we haven't really had many bats in a while. Um, There's probably not a lot around right now, but... I'm not really sure why. One of my ideas is um, they're not really bad, but some mud dauber wasps have built nests in the bat boxes. Oh. And so I'm not really sure. Maybe that's, like, deterring the bats from coming. Um, so the other thing is, like, well, two out of our three bat boxes are mounted on pine trees. Which, you know, everybody tells you not to put bat boxes on trees, but these are a little different because they're pine trees and they're they're mounted below the branches. So, you know, they're kind of like a pole. And that's what the bat box, the bats have used one of the bat boxes on the on the pine tree in the middle of the yard. Yeah. But when I build that big one, I plan to put it on a metal pole and, um, you know, try to make it kind of like ideal <laughs> so they'll really use it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we definitely try to do the wildlife attracting. I mean, it's kind of a semi-rural area that we're in, um, but um, so we get a lot of cool wildlife. We've had um, coral snakes in our yard, <laughs> um, and other just smaller, random, you know, non-venomous snakes. We haven't, I mean, for being on water, I have not seen a water moccasin. Have you? No, I haven't seen any in... Um... We've seen, you've seen cop. we said they had copper yeah, heads yeah. on the road. Yeah, yeah, we've seen live ones around the neighborhood. Oh, you have? Okay. And I moved one off the road by our mailbox, oh, I don't know, six months ago. But yeah, I know there's copperheads around. We had an eastern hognose snake in our yard. Oh, yeah, that was cool. I don't know. My only thinking is um, with the water moccasins, the, maybe there's a, because we saw two otters up the creek. Oh, maybe they north, north in our pond one time. And that's really where the water moccasins would hang out if we had them. But otters really like to eat snakes. So maybe the family of otters have just kind of really kept the snakes, the water moccasins in check up there. And so that's why we really don't see them. Yeah, because I've never, I mean, I always kind of am cautious when I go down by the pond, but I've never like, I've never thought really yeah, to in, worry about it. Yeah, in <laughs> Texas, I mean, it's. It's very common in in Texas to see water moccasins, yeah. so it's like kind of it's weird very not to odd that one. yeah we have never seen one here. Yeah, I'm not really sure why. So, yeah, I mean, and the coral snakes, I mean, are really cool. Um, 
and I don't know. We unfortunately, when we first moved in, we had a a neighbor, a woman. Um, she was really nice, but she was just, I don't know. She was hardened to get over here, so she didn't really care about our yard too much. But now we have another, another neighbor who's nice as well, but... As with most people, there he's not a snake person, and so we've kind of tried. I don't know. If, I don't know if Chris has tried to like not tell him to s- kill snakes. I mean, but yeah. we're definitely not of the kill snake variety of people. So we try to educate people on you know, on not killing them if there's no reason to. So I don't know. Maybe maybe we can. Rub yeah, off I don't know. I on think, him. <laughs> I kind of think he's. You know, like probably, probably like most people. I mean, and I, in a way, I understand the thinking. It's just, I don't know. I guess I don't agree with it that, you know, a lot of people just kill every snake they see in their yard um, for no reason, even if it's good or bad or not bothering them or whatever, just because they think it's kind of, kind of like, you know, if you saw a mouse in your house, you know, you don't want it there. That's, you know, kind of how some people think about snakes. Right. So... Anyway, so, I mean, I hope he doesn't, in the long run, cause a detriment to the snake population, so, um, in our area, but we'll see. Hopefully, we'll just slowly educate him, and maybe he'll just talk to Chris, like, when he sees one, and Chris can run out and, you know, figure out how to relocate it instead of having him kill it. (laughs) So, um... Anything else? Uh, the citrus, how are they doing? Um, the citrus are doing pretty good. They're finally starting to get established. You know, I haven't let them fruit at all in two years that we've had them. Um, and, you know, citrus are, are, are different than what I talked about trimming trees earlier. Uh, citrus, you don't want to trim uh, this time of year. You want to trim citrus uh, in the spring, kind of in the early spring after after pretty much any chance of freeze is gone. Um, so I'm not going to trim any of them right now, but I'm going to let two of them fruit next year. The lemon and the satsuma. Um, I'll let those fruit for the first time. Um, and then we have a... Misty bought me an Ujukitsu orange. Oh, that's right. And so I'm not going to let it fruit, though, because it's the smallest one. And it's not big enough yet, so I'll fertilize it and just try to get it to grow as much as possible again next year, and then you know hopefully let it start to fruit the year after that. Yeah, and then we have that olive, but it seems to be like just yeah, sitting the there olive doing tree. Nothing. No, it's definitely growing. No, it's it's growing for sure. Um, we have, a, I think it's a arbokina yeah, olive. I think so. It's either arbokina or arbosana, one or the other. And, um, I don't know. I don't really ever expect to get olives off of it. It's just kind of a interesting tree. Yeah. It's just kind of a different tree to have. Um, it's probably going to take forever to grow anyway. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if we ever got olives, I'd be amazed. <laughs> I mean, you know, it makes, it does make edible olives, It'll but be like 60 when it gets, olives. I don't know. I'm not, it's just more of a tree to me than. I'm not really trying to grow it for fruit. Yeah. And you planted those Dawn Redwoods. Are they still alive? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The. Or did you plant one or two? I planted. You planted one by the water, right? At least. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think two by, I think there's two by the water and one a little further up. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that's over right on the property line between us and our neighbors doing the best. Um, and then one of the ones I planted by the pond is doing okay and the other one is not it's still alive but it wasn't doing good before the fall um they've all i think they've pretty much gone dormant now so i'm just kind of kind of wait till spring spring to see if they come back but they're um they're a really neat tree if you've never heard of don redwood do a google search and look them up they're they were thought to be extinct. They're, they were known in uh, fossils, and they found a population of them in China. I want to say like in the 1960s, but it might have been the 50s, um, in a very remote area. And um, they propagated them and gave them to like botanical gardens and things. And now, I mean, they were super easy to propagate um, just by seed. Um and so now you can you can get them online on eBay or even I've seen them at our local nursery. 
Um, but they're very, very similar to bald cypress. Like if you, if you didn't know what it was, you'd probably think it was a bald cypress. Um, the needles, the leaves are bigger and the leaves are, uh, grow opposite each other on a, on the stem. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas bald cypress grow alternate Mm. on the stem. But they're very, they look very similar. The trunks are diff- the same, very similar. They both really like water. They can grow in standing water. Um, but the Don Redwoods don't get any knees at all. <laughs> but, you know, if you have two growing next to each other, they're pretty okay. similar. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I don't know which, I think Don Redwoods are, Don Redwoods are known to grow very fast. Um, and bald cypress are kind of, medium growers i think so i don't know i'm kind of interested to see in the long run if the dawn redwoods like you know outgrow overtake. the cypress yeah. um i won't let them overtake them i'll keep them i don't know i won't let them grow over the cypress but right i don't know i guess we'll just see what happens yeah but i you know i really i planted those along the shoreline to stabilize our bank um yeah when we moved in we had a lot of chinese tallow which is an invasive uh <clears throat> tree here and um some other just kind of crappy shrub stuff that it was just not good on the shoreline so and we also have um wild taro that's like out of control it's also invasive yeah it's horrible which is it's it's pretty but it's it it takes over and it it will congest things really badly so um and it's it's pretty much like swallowed up like a lot of our native plantings and things we've planted along the shoreline so chris has been working on trying to manually get rid of it in clumps and he did really good on one shoreline section of shoreline um i don't know probably a year and a half or two years ago and um kept it under control but he's been working on the other side in the last few months and um it's just it's a hard chore so he only does what he can at at times and um i'm sure he'll get it under control and you know, I'll try to help. I have to wrangle the toddler a lot of the time, so um, I'm not able to do as much as I want at the moment. But as soon as he's better at being outside, kind of by himself, I'll be able to help a lot more on some of those things than I am now. So I don't know, I think we've covered a lot. I'm sure there's more we could ramble on about, but we'll save it for another podcast later. But yeah, maybe like in the spring, spring when things are growing, fruiting, and doing. Coming back alive. Yeah. So thanks for joining here. <laughs> um, and you can um, listen to this on iTunes. Don't forget to subscribe. And I don't have any ratings or reviews yet, so you could do that for me. Or you can subscribe on Stitcher or listen on the podcast website, thegardenpathpodcast.com. Um, you can also email me at thegardenpathpodcast at gmail.com if you have any questions or um, suggestions on potential episodes in the future. So thanks for joining us. All right, talk to you later.